good afternoon. Uh, in fact, uh, today's uh, lecture we are going to devote on theory of elites, democratic pluralism, and uh, the ruling class. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, discussion is part of uh, the larger discourse of comparative politics in political science. And uh, in fact, this uh, entire issue of uh, domination has been, uh, you know, has been there as a very important theme in comparative politics. That the what are the sources of domination, particularly in democracy, and there are multiple theories of political domination in democracy, and uh, some of those theories uh, are uh, basically part of. Uh, uh, you know the curriculum uh, also uh, in comparative politics, and they include the theory of elites, uh, political pluralism, and the ruling class. So there are three uh, different theories of domination, and you know these th three theories. If ideologically, if you divide this, uh, you know this debate, uh, then one can say that you know this debate is largely between the Marxists and the liberals, uh, and one can say that you know uh, the pluralists particularly. You know, are part of the larger uh, liberal you know dispensation because you know they debate this issue of uh, domination uh, you know particularly within democracy within the pluralist frame whereas the ruling class theory is the marxist uh, you know uh, you know theory or one can say that part of the larger marxist uh, you know framework uh, through which you know this entire uh, analysis of domination uh, exploitations and you know subordination are discussed. So therefore, there are uh, three important theories which we are going to touch upon, particularly in course of our discussion, uh, which will be spread in two parts. Today is the first part of our discussion on a theory of elites, pluralism, and the ruling class. Now, one thing is uh, important to remember uh, that you know out of these three theories, uh, in fact, one can call that elites and you know the pluralist theories are non-Marxian non in their orientation, whereas the ruling class, as I mentioned, that is clearly a Marxist uh, you know, discourse on the domination and subordination in society. Now, of course, uh, you know, this theory of political elites uh, acquire very important place in comparative politics uh, because you know, theory of political elites uh, is a theory which tries to puncture uh, some of the essential uh, premises of both uh, liberal democratic theory as well as uh, you know the Marxist theory. It punctures the liberal democratic theory particularly uh, on the issue of uh, you know popular will and the majority rule and call both of them as fiction. Whereas you know it punctures the Marxist theory on the issue of uh, you know the class domination uh, and the exercise of political power by the ruling class. Uh, because, you know, as it is well known that Marxism and Marxist theory, they believe uh, that one who has a control on means of production in society, uh, that class, in fact, exercises political power as well by virtue of the fact that it has a control on the means of production. So, therefore, uh, what we find uh, that the elitist theory or the theory of, you know, political elitism, as it is often referred to, you know, runs against uh, these two dominant traditions. Uh, in comparative politics and political science, that is liberal democratic theory and the Marxist theory. Therefore, uh, it draws a lot of attention of the scholars that what are its premises. And, uh, you know, those premises have been countered, have been critiqued, have been challenged, but nonetheless, some of the arguments which they offer are often considered to be uh, very important and therefore they deserve attention. So, in fact, we'll be looking at some of the premises. Uh, but one thing is very important to remember that this entire theory of political elites uh, basically starts with this important, uh, you know, submission that the elites there are there are a group of there is a group of people uh, in the society uh, who are endowed with certain special attributes, uh, you know, to rule, uh, and therefore uh, they rule by virtue of those attributes, and this is common in all societies. Uh, no society is an exception to this rule. So therefore, this entire popular will in the majority rule, rule, which are basically the lifeline of democratic theory, a liberal democratic theory, that within democracy it is majority uh, whose will ultimately prevails. And therefore, uh, in fact, this entire idea of common good, uh, you know, is there. Uh, you know, entire thing is basically dismissed by this uh, theory. It says that there cannot be any 
common uh, good and number two this majority never rules it is only the minority in society who rules who is this minority and it is here this entire argument for elitism comes because the elite theory believes that this minority is no, no other than a group of people with special attributes who are the elites of the society uh, because you know they are the ones who are indispensable so far as the governance is concerned uh, you know, it doesn't matter that what type of society you create, but nonetheless, they will always remain indispensable. Without them, no governance, no, you know, uh, administration, uh, no state functioning would be possible. So therefore, this is perhaps one of the important uh, submission of this uh, theory of political elites. Now, of course, there are many protagonists of this theory. Uh, in fact, the three important pioneers, so far as this uh, theory of political elite is concerned, or elite theory of, you know, the elites are concerned, uh, one can say that there are three important protagonists, Pareto, Mosca, and Mitchells. And of course, uh, there are certain commonalities, but then also differences. They approach the issue from different vantage points. Their style of argument is different. Their premises also sometimes uh, become different, but nonetheless, they share one thing in common, that all three of them consider elites to be indispensable part of uh, you know, society. So therefore, this is something we should remember. But one thing, uh, you know, before we uh, move further, because you know, there are different streaks of this uh, theory, uh, and particularly three different traditions can be identified. For example, uh, you know, the classical elitism, uh, you know, and uh, then you have, uh, you know, the modified elite theory and democratic elitism. These are the three important variants. Uh, we'll basically have a look at it, that what are those variants. But before that, some of the important premises of this theory uh, need attention. What are the premises of this theory? The first important premise of this theory is that politics is a study of power and the elite groups control decision making. So therefore, this centrality of power uh, is basically recognized uh, in this theory. That after all, politics is nothing uh, but a study of power. Politics is nothing but competition for power. And ultimately, uh, you know, in society, this power is controlled by a set of people whom are called elites. So therefore, they have the control on the decision making. Now, the purpose of their study this entire purpose of this study, that is elite theory, is to study the nature of power and its acquisition and maintenance. So therefore, the purpose is very clear. That purpose is to study the nature of power in society and its acquisition and maintenance, that how it is acquired and how it is maintained. The another important purpose of this study is to see the interplay between elites and the masses. Uh, particularly uh, by, you know, through the tools like myth and symbol. Because ultimately, you know, what happens uh, that elites and masses have to interact. It is a different matter that elites rule and masses are basically subjected to rule. But nonetheless, uh, even in that process, the masses and elites have a very close interaction. And therefore, what happens that, you know, uh, th this study tries to see the interplay, particularly through tools like myth, symbol, and uh, other similar, you know, uh, methods. The third is to establish the objectivity of the social science and to say, uh, to uh, you know, demonstrate that social science can be as objective as natural science, uh, particularly from the point of view of realist analysis. Because one of the criticism of this theory against the earlier theories, including liberalism or Marxism, is that, you know, these theories are more ideological. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, ideologies, more, they are ideologies, uh, you know, before they are any scientific analysis, uh, because their ideology hinders any realist, uh, realistic explanation of society. So, therefore, uh, this elite theory also claims to be objective and neutral. They say that whatever they say is based on their explanation of the concrete reality. It is not something uh, which is basically driven by their ideologies or ideological proclivity. So therefore, these are some of the important premises of elite theory as a whole, uh, be it classical elitism or one can say the other variants uh, which came later, uh, you know, which we'll be looking at 
in course of our discussion. So therefore, in, in fact, there are three you know, sets of this elite theory, as I mentioned uh, just now. The first is the classical elitism. And it is about the classical elitism that I was referring to, that they are considered uh, the pioneers so far as uh, the elite theory is concerned. Pareto, Mosca, and Mitchells will have a detailed discussion of their argument. That's why uh, they are considered the pioneer of this theory. Then comes the modified elite theory. Particularly in 20th century, certain scholars try to modify the argument of elite theory uh, by recognizing the importance of a handful of people in terms of the governance in society, particularly in advanced industrial uh, capitalist societies. But nonetheless, they try to modify because they thought that earlier classical elitist theory uh, didn't take into account uh, you know, the changes which have happened uh, within the capitalist society, within the democratic, liberal democratic order, largely on account of massive industrialization. And this modified elite theory was promoted by two scholars, James Burnham, particularly in his famous book, Managerial Revolution, which was published in 1941, and C. Wright Mills, particularly his, uh, you know, this... Uh, seminal work called The Power Elites, which was published in 1956. So therefore, uh, the theories which uh, they propounded are considered modified elite theory. One thing is to remember that there is a difference between Burnham and Wright Mill's argument. Both, though, try to modify the classical elitism, but nonetheless, there are differences between the two. For example, Burnham gave importance to the economic structure the means of production, particularly the corporate world, the managerial class, that how the managerial class has emerged out of this, due to this industrial revolution. And that managerial class basically caused the sorts. Basically, it is the managerial class who is uh, the ruler, or one can say the decision maker. The capitalists, of course, initially, they ruled, but later on, they left production and concentrated on finance, Later and later on, ran away from finance also, and therefore, uh, you know what has happened that a managerial class has emerged in this society, which is ultimately, uh, you know, responsible for decision making. So this is James Barnum. She Wright Mills, uh, rather, goes uh, slightly farther and provides a more nuanced ar argument uh, of uh, this entire process. Instead of simply confining his argument to economic structure, C. Wright Mills talks about, uh, you know, the different, you know, important institutions, or in his words, three important institutions, or loci of power in society. And these three important loci, he, according to C. Wright Mills, are, uh, in fact, the corporate world, and the corporates, the, uh, you know, big industries, corporates, and number two, the executive, federal executive power, United States of America. And number three, the military, uh, you know, and what Eisenhower once called military industrial complex. So therefore, uh, you know, C. Wright Mills tried to establish that elites from these three sectors in society, particularly United States of America, that they constitute the ruling elites. They are the power elites as the title of his book also suggests. And they basically decide uh, the fate of governance. And they are the ones who wield political power. So therefore, this is something she Wright Mills. So he tried to modify the classical elitism, but unlike James Burnham, does not, get, does not restrict his entire framework to economic sphere only. But in fact, he spreads his net slightly wider and brings in two more sectors into the discussion, the executive and the federal executive, particularly United States of America, and the military power, particularly the power which, uh, you know, the Army, Navy, uh, and Air Force combined form they exercise uh, in terms of their strategic importance in society. So this is sea right news. Now the third important, uh, you know, streak within this theory is called democratic elitism. And this is associated with uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, you know, a great economist uh, who is credited with authoring this classic work 
Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy in 1943. And Sumpeter, uh, you know, tried to portray the functioning of democratic society uh, through this elitist argument that how democracy as uh, a kind of system which is normally believed to be functioning according to the principle of majority rule, according to the principle of popular will, according to the principle of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of uh, popular elections. Uh, he said that elections are there, political parties are there. And therefore, because of the presence of political parties in a competitive atmosphere, what happens that ultimately in democracy, it becomes an exchange between the elites and the masses. Uh, you know, the elections are only means through which the people are basically participating in elections, in rejecting and selecting the, a party for governance. But nonetheless, so far as the elites are concerned, the elites from different political parties, after they secure this mandate, they become the rulers. So therefore, in fact, democracy, it is not the people who rule, rather it is the elites who rule. So therefore, in fact, this entire, uh, you know, dictum that democracy is a form of government of the people, by the people and for the people. Uh, he said that of the people is valid, for the people is also valid, but it is a government of the people, uh, you know, that is not valid according to Schumpeter and some of the other elite theorists also, because they believe that ultimately it is a government, uh, you know, by the elites, not by the masses. So this, therefore, you know, there are three different streaks, and we'll have to look at all three of them, particularly, uh, you know, in order to establish that how this elitist theory is not confined to only classical elitism, but has also uh, gone ahead with that, you know, changes in society, changes in economy, and with the passage of time. But before that, first, let's have a look at the classical elitism that what is this classical elitism? Now classical elitism, one thing is to be remembered that it is a reaction to the process of democratization in 19th century. Because 19th century is the period uh, when you know, large scale democratization of the world happened, particularly the Western uh, societies. Uh, in fact, you know, this uh, entire argument about the waves of democracy of Huntington also locate the first wave in the 19th century. So therefore, uh, 19th century is remembered as a period when large scale democratization happened. Now, this due to this democratization, what happened? That some of the important arguments about the popular sovereignty and the po common good and the rule of the majority were in circulation. As many of us should recall that Rousseau the great social contract theorist and the liberal, uh, particularly so far as the origin of the state is concerned, also uh, is credited for basically theorizing this popular will through his concept of general will, uh, you know, uh, in his theory of contract. So therefore, what happened? And that this popular sovereignty became a very powerful, uh, you know, basis for this entire discourse on democracy. This entire thrust for republican form of government was basically the product of uh, such intellectual climate. Now what happens that this classical elitism, as it is associated with these three people, as I mentioned, Pareto, Mosca, and Mitchell, try to dismiss this entire concept of popular sovereignty as fiction. There's, a, there's nothing like popular sovereignty. There is nothing called majority rule. Uh, in fact, uh, it is simply the elites who rule everywhere and no society is an exception. So this is something uh, to be remembered, that they simply dismissed this entire uh, quest for popular sovereignty and the majority rule, and dismissed it as fiction. Now one thing is uh, you know, to be remembered, that this classical elitist theory, uh, they argued uh, that it is the elites who control the resources in society. Uh, and therefore, what happens uh, that because of their control on the resources, uh, what happens that they play important role? How they control the resources? That is an important question uh, to ask. Uh, in fact, uh, the elite, this theory would also say uh, that you know, uh, you know, this theory also re not only rejects 
the liberal democratic argument for majority rule, but at the same time, in the same breath, it also rejects the claim of Marxism about the classless society. And because, you know, Marxism, uh, crit Marxism criticizes liberal society uh, for creating uh, class domination of the bourgeoisie. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing is very clear, that this theory rejects both the liberal democracy, the theory of liberal democracy, as well as the theory of Marxian socialism. Because it believes that this classless society, the kind of, uh, you know, the imaginary society about which the Marxism discusses, is not possible. Because there is no escape from the elite's rule. So therefore, elite's rule is going to be there. Now what happens uh, that this theory calls, therefore, all these theories, be it liberal democratic theory or the Marxist theory, as ideologies, uh, not scientific uh, theories. Because there is a difference between theory and ideology. Because theory is something which explains the truth. But ideology is something which only tries to establish the supremacy of certain set of ideas, irrespective of uh, truth and reality. So therefore, they call both of them as an ideology. In fact, uh, here one can say that Moscow's historical method and Mitchell's iron law of oligarchy uh, are based on the characteristics of human aggregate. And therefore, they say that it is not something imaginary. It is not something driven by ideological proclivity. But rather, they are based on the characteristics of human aggregate, which can be seen in every society. So therefore, uh, in fact, this is something important to remember. Now, Mosca not only rejects liberal democratic theory, but also rejects Rousseau's popular sovereignty as a myth, as I mentioned earlier. Because Rousseau was a great influence on liberal democratic theory, so far as this majority is concerned. And of course, as I uh, discussed in context of some other uh, themes earlier, and that liberal democratic theory has always been wrestling with this question of tyranny of the majority. On the one hand, they basically glorify the rule of the majority because ultimately they believe that majority in democracy is sovereign, their will is sovereign, and this is what is implied by popular sovereignty. On the other hand, this fear about the tyranny of the majority is always there, and this tyranny has been tried to be checkmated by a number of mechanisms within liberal democratic theory. And this fear of tyranny of the majority has been there from John Stuart Mill to, you know, Madison to many others who have followed. And therefore, they have devised and they have argued for a number of measures through which this tyranny of the majority is, can be checkmated. But the elite theory says that there is no reason to be afraid of this tyranny of the majority. Because majority does not rule. It is a minority who is the elites in the society because of certain attributes, certain of, because of certain qualities, because of their psychological makeup that they ultimately rule. Of course, there is a difference among the three streaks of, uh, you know, this elitist theory which I just now mentioned. Because some of them give more emphasis to psychological dimension, whereas the other scholars emphasize the organizational dimension where organizational you know intricacies and compulsions of modern societies and they say that because of organizational compulsions that a handful of people who is in minority in society they in fact become important and indispensable it is not because of psychological reason alone rather the organizational challenges are as such that the masses cannot govern Masses have to rely on the experts, on the technocrats, uh, on the, you know, the specialists, or certain handful of people uh, are basically trusted. They are entrusted, they are trusted, and they are basically, uh, you know, looked after. Particularly, they look for their, uh, look at them for the support so far as the delivery of goods is concerned. So therefore, uh, in fact, this is something important uh, for them, so far as their argument goes. As I mentioned earlier, that they say that government is of the people, but, and for the people, but it can never become by the people. Because this entire slogan of of the people, for the people, and by the people is nothing uh, but a kind of proverb. Because according to this elitist theory, the by the people is not possible, only the minorities, that is the elites, 
will always rule. So therefore, as I mentioned, they refute both Marx and liberal theory, and they want to establish a neutral social science. And, and they call everything associated with Marxism as an ideology, because they, on the one hand, it is to remember that they accept Marxist criticism of liberalism, but instead of advocating revolution, uh, they give a middle class to its arguments. Their criticism of liberalism, that is Marxist criticism of liberalism, they say that is valid, that it is not the rule of the masses. The popular will is a fiction. Marxism would also argue that, because popular will is basically amorphous will. Popular will is, popular will is you know, divided uh, you know, along class lines. Uh, you know, when the liberal theory talks of popular will, it simply ignores and glosses over the fact that the will of the people is a stratified will. The various strata within this. It is basically crisscrossed by number of conflicting class interests. But you know, liberalism tries to camouflage it and calls one general will, one popular will. So therefore, this criticism of Marxism appeals to them. But fact of the matter is that instead of arguing for a revolutionary reconstruction of society, the way perhaps Marxism would like us to believe or do, uh, you know, this theory, uh, you know, gives this entire argument a middle class twist. And therefore, uh, you know, instead of locating the power, the source of power in society in mode of production, as Marxism does, uh, because mode of production in Marxist theory includes the means of production, uh, forces of production and relations of production. And this is how the social formation is explained historically within the Marxist theory. We'll have discussion, uh, you know, particularly in the second part of our, uh, you know, lecture when we'll take up this question of ruling class. But, you know, the elitist theory gives a middle class twist and takes it in a different direction. He said that it is not the mode of production, which is the source of power in society, but it is the lever of power uh, you know, uh, you know, in other areas, not in economic area. And where is it? That is perhaps a matter to be explained. And it is here that they maintain, or rather they drift from the Marxian argument about a classless society. And uh, they also argue that classless society is a big myth because division is so perennial to society that there will always be division in the society between elites and non-elites, uh, those who would rule and those who will not rule, between the majority and the minority. So therefore, a majority of, you know, the governed and the minority of, uh, you know, the rulers. So therefore, this is how, uh, you know, this entire thing uh, goes. Now, coming to this uh, classical elitist theory, there are three important pioneers, as I mentioned, Pareto, Mosca, and Mitchells. And we have to, you know, take into account their arguments and their contributions. Uh, because, you know, what happens uh, that Pareto, uh, you know, is a very important uh, thinker, uh, you know, so far as uh, the theory of elitism is concerned, uh, particularly a theory of domination is concerned. In fact, Pareto uh, was an Italian economist, sociologist, and philosopher, because his arguments straddled in these three uh, branches of knowledge. So therefore, he is considered a very important figure so far as this theory is concerned. In fact, his book, The Treatise on General Sociology and the Mind and Society, are uh, basically uh, considered a seminal work so far as this theory is concerned. In fact, Pareto lays the foundation for great, uh, you know, grand elite theory. Uh, many scholars believe that Pareto's argument was, uh, in fact, a retort to Karl Marx, particularly the way he tried to explain, uh, you know, the class, uh, classes in society, the domination in society, and the way he critiqued uh, liberalism, capitalism, and the capitalist social order. So some of the criticism, of course, uh, they thought uh, valid, particularly so far as the rejection of liberalism, the popular will, the common good are concerned. But nonetheless, most of the premises of Marxist theory, they are very dismissive of. In that Pareto argues that elites are neither the product of economic forces nor of organizational ability. In fact, they are the product of human attributes uh, which are constant in history. And it is here we should remember that Pareto, uh, you know, gives important to individual attributes of elites. Uh, and he said that they are constant in history. Now, this 
uh, definition of elites, uh, in fact, uh, is also to be remembered for Pareto, is with the reference to achievements and not morals. Uh, because uh, normally, you know, this discourse on morality has been there in social sciences. But Pareto didn't believe that. Uh, in fact, he thought that, you know, their skills, uh, the skills and attributes of these elites explain their strategic location in the society. The person with the highest indices, uh, in fact, persons with the highest indices in each field of human activity are clubbed together and they are normally known as elites. So therefore, this is how Pareto approaches uh, his uh, you know, theme, his discussion. Now, Pareto divides uh, in fact, uh, you know, the elites into two categories. Normally, the earlier division uh, which was prevalent was the governing elites and the non-governing elites. That those who govern uh, are the part of the governing elites, particularly those who directly govern, those who have a role in the government, and those uh, who indirectly play role, they, you know, also consider the part of the governing elite because if you have any role, any say in governance, you are part of the governing elite. Whereas there are non-governing elites, uh, in fact, where those who are simply taking orders, though are those who are basically subjected to, the, subjected to governance, they are part of the governing elites. But Paresto, instead of you know, subscribing to such classification, preferred a more simpler distinction between elites and non-elites. He didn't believe this governing and non-governing and thought that this distinction has to be between elites and non-elites. And he also went to the extent of arguing that history of all societies is conflict between the two, the elites and non-elites. Something reminiscent of what Karl Marx said, that history of all hitherto existing societies is a history of class struggle. So therefore, this is something uh, important so far as Pareto's argument is concerned. Now, Pareto also said that all human actions are not logical. This attempt to give a logical color to human action, the rationality, which became very powerful a uh, mode of argument subsequently, uh, you know, in social science, uh, you know, Pareto would not agree with this argument. He would say that all human actions are uh, not logical. Rather, one can say that most human actions are non-logical. On basis of uh, human instincts and residues, they reflect, uh, you know, according to Pareto, that two classes emerge, that the classes of elites and the non-elites. And therefore, according to Pareto, that it gives us important clue to understand elite domination. That why elites dominate on basis of these instincts and the residue they reflect, particularly the way they function. Now, of course, in, you know, uh, Pareto even also says that there are two, uh, you know, uh, you know, there are two uh, different, uh, you know, types of classes of, uh, you know, people. Uh, or one can say the elites. And this is something very important from the point of view of uh, his theory. Now his, uh, you know, Pareto, because, you know, feels that the instincts, the human instincts, and the residuary they reflect, lead to uh, the two classes in society, uh, the two types of people in the society. And what are these two classes of people is something to be, uh, you know, remembered. The class one type of people, he said that class one is the instinct of combination. Those who possess this instinct is the instinct of combination. Where what happens? That impulse to put together ideas through use of imagination. And in this category, Pareto would like to put art, ideology, political coalition, maneuver, you know, uh, you know and all these things. And he would say that all these things stem, stem from this instinct. That is the instincts of instinct of combination. The class two, uh, you know, type according to Pareto is the instinct of persistence. And here he said that the instinct of persistence of aggregate uh, or the desire to consolidate what is already established. So therefore, he would make a dis you know division between these two types of people or two types of instinct, class one and class two. The first one. The no, no, second one, that is the instinct of permanence, stability, order, uh, you know, is there, as I mentioned, that is a class two, but he would not say that it is traditionalism. Uh, in fact, 
uh, here, you know, while discussing these types, these instincts, Pareto uh, goes uh, to the extent of borrowing uh, something from Machiavelli, particularly the way Machiavelli made a distinction between lion and fox in terms of his, uh, you know, the leaders, uh, you know, the leadership qualities. And uh, in fact, Pareto also borrows from Machiavelli this lion and fox category. In fact, for Pareto, uh, this lion and fox category lead to different types of governance. Uh, for fox, uh, he believed that it, is, it leads to governance through consent, whereas, you know, the lion, uh, you know, is basically a kind of, uh, you know, a quality which leads to the governance through force. And therefore, uh, he also believed that, you know, lion stands for a status quoism. Uh, and, uh, you know, Pareto also interestingly said that politics is such a, such a, you know, a sphere of social life which requires both types of uh, people, both types of qualities, fox and lion. Uh, in fact, so this is something interesting to see that how Pareto, uh, you know, borrowed or one can say that uh, drew on Machiavellian di distinction between fox and lion. Uh, and uh, try to, you know, bring into his discussion of elites so far as the governance is concerned. Now, history according to uh, Pareto is a circulation of b these two types of people, fox and lion. And politics requires both of them. It cannot be solely dependent on either one attribute, that is the attributes of a fox or the attributes of a, a lion. Now, one thing is important to remember and that, uh, you know, the category one, uh, type which I mentioned, this imagination, uh, you know, where you have number of things, and that is the instinct of combination, where, you know, impulse to put together ideas uh, through use of imagination, art, ideology, political coalition, maneuver, all these things are category one, whereas the class two type, uh, you know, is basically something which applies to non-elites. So the class one applies to elites and class two applies to the non-elites. Now this Class two type, uh, according to Pareto, is impassive and unimaginative, uh, because you know the masses that is non-elites are of this type. They are passive. They are unimaginative. Uh, but nonetheless, one thing is very important to remember that according to Pareto, there is always a possibility of circulation of elites between governing and non-governing sphere between the you know between the elites and the non-elites because this is how the elites renewal is also happening uh, in society and you know elites renewal is important now there are many criticisms of pareto as well first criticism is, is that it is more of a psychological theory uh, than a historical which he claims number two uh, in fact he claims it to be a historical theory but many scholars argue that it basically betrays traces of a historicism. And number three, the criticism is that it is, you know, outrightly an anti-egalitarian argument, which basically Pareto offers, which is not valid in modern times when the modern quest has been for uh, equality, the modern quest has been for egalitarianism. So therefore, these are some of the criticisms of Pareto. But nonetheless, no one can deny that he continues to be, uh, you know, the chief, uh, you know, protagonist of this classical elitism. Now, that takes us to the next important thinker of this uh, theory, and he is Moshka. Now, of course, the Moshka published a book, Ruling Class, in 1896. In fact, a lot of scholars believe that Moshka is more historical and sociological than Pareto. Uh, in fact, Mosca uh, accepted uh, Aristotle's classification of government, uh, which Aristotle had made, uh, you know, in ancient time, in ancient Greek. Uh, you know, the kind of classification Aristotle made uh, is still considered very significant from the point of view of comparative politics and comparative government. Now, Aristotle had made a classification, uh, you know, tripartite classification, the monarchy, oligarchy and democracy. That is a uh, rule of one or rule of many. Along, you know, the number of people who are ruling and the purpose for which they are ruling. This was the, basically the basis on which, you know, Aristotle made this classification. But, you know, what Mosca does, uh, you know, that he, on the one hand, refers to this classification, 
uh, for certain reasons, but nonetheless calls this classification as myth. Because according to Mosca, neither rule by one nor the rule by many uh, is feasible. Rather, it never happens in history. So therefore, he basically uh, on the one hand refers to Aristotle, but on the other hand uh, rejects his theory as well. Uh, in fact, uh, Mosca believes that why, argues that why elites rule ultimately. We have seen already Pareto who uh, talked about attributes. But Mosca's argument is that elites are more organized than masses. And therefore, you know, they have an added advantage over the masses. Now, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that elites, according to them, are in minority, but they are not apologetic about it. That why minority is ruling. In democracy today, everyone would say that minority, of course, needs to be protected, but so far as the rule is concerned, it has to be by the majority will. But, you know, this elitist theory, uh, you know, of Moscow would say that minority has an added advantage and therefore elites as a minority in society enjoy that added advantage. Uh, in fact, therefore, it believes that, you know, uh, you know, the elites are more organized than the masses. And, uh, you know, there is a faster communication among them. There are many advantages, uh, you know, in this, uh, you know, this category of elites, that is, the, you know, the minorities, because they are more organized, uh, there is a faster communication, the information can be shared faster. So, you know, therefore, this is something, uh, you know, Mosca highlights in his theory. Of course, Mosca's, what happens, uh, you know, the, he rather prefers political class instead of, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, political elite, the terminology. But nonetheless, argument does not deviate from the argument of elite theory. But the term he prefers is the political class. And therefore, the book also he authored was the ruling class in 1896. Uh, of course, one has to be careful to see that the usage of the term ruling class does not mean uh, that he subscribed to the Marxist theory in any sense of the term. Now, what, uh, you know, the Mosca does, uh, that he makes a distinction uh, of, you know, between the two types, two groups within this political class. That is the higher stratum and the lower stratum. And in the higher stratum, he puts the party bosses uh, in the inner circle. Uh, in fact, it is very interesting to see that initially Moscow was dismissive of representative democracy. But later on, he started adding a lot of importance to the representative democracy and the political parties. So therefore, in fact, uh, he makes a distinction between the two stratum uh, within the political class, the lower stratum and the higher stratum. Uh, and, uh, you know, he believes uh, that this higher stratum uh, is basically the stratum which is the inner core of uh, you know, inner core of this, uh, you know, of, of political parties, the party bosses, they constitute, uh, you know, the real elites, uh, because, you know, they uh, are the grand electors, uh, because it is a misconception that in democracy, it is the masses who elect their representatives. He believes that it is the party bosses who work behind the scene uh, without having any legal uh, support, legal sanction, but from the, behind the scene, they basically decide that who should be a people's representative. Uh, of course, uh, in fact, uh, Moscow went to the extent of saying that people with, of integrity will never contest elections because representatives are the mediocre people. But as I mentioned that gradually he modified his opinion on the representative democracy and, uh, you know, made some changes. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he thought that ultimately it is the party bosses, the elites, the inner core, which is more important. Now, coming to this political system distinction, uh, you, know, uh, you know, he makes, and that is very refreshing and very interesting, a reminiscent of what Aristotle had done. As I mentioned in the beginning, when I, was, I started discussing Moscow, that he refers to Aristotle, but rejects Aristotle. Uh, he believes that Aristotle's, you know, classification of government uh, based on few and many is impracticable and is not feasible and is not available in any part of our history. But, you know, he, when he himself comes to the political system, uh, he basically decides to classify the political system uh, in two categories. 
And these two categories are also uh, something very interesting to uh, see. The first is that on basis of the direction of the flow of authority, that authority is flowing in which direction? From bottom to top or from top to bottom? The number is the source of recruitment, that how the people are being uh, recruited into the ruling class. Uh, this principle is aristocratic or democratic. Now, this direction of the flow of, uh, you know, the authority, as I mentioned, uh, you know, is basically seen from the point of view of downward and upward uh, movement of authority. If it is basically, uh, you know, downward, then according to Mosca, it is autocratic. If it is upward, then it is liberal, which happens in liberal democracy, that people elect their authorities and they basically rule. So therefore, this direction of the flow of authority is one uh, you know, criteria, one axis on which he does this classification. The second is uh, you know, the recruitment, that how people are recruited in the ruling class, who ultimately goes and joins this uh, you know, higher echelon of society that is called ruling class. And this basis of this recruit recruitment, uh, Mosca does again on basis of two principles, like he does in case of authority, uh, you know, in terms of autocratic and liberal. Here he makes a uh, distinction between aristocratic and democratic. The aristocratic recruitment pattern is uh, that, you know, the descendants of the existing ruling class are recruited into it and there is no, you know, open recruitment from outside. So therefore, if this recruitment is only for the people with the aristocratic descendants, uh, then it is a closed and he calls it aristocratic. And if it is open to all, uh, you know, particularly the lower class, renewal of ruling class is done by inducting new faces, new people from uh, the below, from the lower classes, then he calls it democratic. So therefore, uh, in fact, uh, he, on basis of these two types of direction of flow of authority and source of recruitment, uh, you know, he makes this very interesting analysis. Though, of course, he says uh, that, you know, there is a, you know, there, there are many instances in the world where you have a mixture, the mixed combination of the two available. When he, for example, he gives the instance of United States of America, uh, where he says that one can see both. The president uh, is basically, you know, uh, you know, is a liberal principle, uh, particularly in terms of the authority, uh, you know, the, particularly the flow of authority, uh, according to the first criterion, he said that it is American president appears to be, uh, you know, matching with the liberal principle uh, because he is elected by the people. But when he appoints his cabinet, he appoints his secretary of state, when he appoints the important functionaries of the government, then what happens that it becomes, uh, you know, autocratic uh, because it is he who decides and people have no say. So therefore, USA is a combination of the two, uh, you know, particularly the liberal and, uh, you know, autocratic. Uh, so this is how, uh, you know, he basically says that there are instances where this combination exists and, uh, you know, the problems and limitations he feels that uh, are in both, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in this uh, recruitment and particularly the devolution of authority. Now, the two principles of authority and the two tendencies of recruitment, as I just now mentioned, uh, can be combined into the four ways, uh, you know, on basis of which the comparative political analysis can happen according to the Mosca's framework, which we have just now uh, deline delineated. The autocratic authority system, according to Mosca, would imply the aristocratic, uh, you know, auto autocratic authority and aristocratic recruitment. Autocratic authority means that the you know, authority will flow uh, downwards uh, and the aristocratic recruitment that it is basically people are recruited into ruling class mostly from the descendants of the aristocrats. That is hereditary uh, and monarchy can be the example of this. Number two, that you know, some uh, representative democracy in Britain, uh, you know, according to some scholars is the combination of this liberal principle with, you know, democratic tendency. Uh, because, you know, what happens uh, that Mosca uh, believes that such combination is there, but nonetheless, one thing is important to remember, 
uh, that uh, you know this this is how the comparative politics uh, you know political systems can be uh, you know classified now after mosca uh, there are uh, you know there are certain you know th there is a third pioneer of this classical elitism and he is michels and michels is also very important uh, because michels is someone uh, who's book political parties published in 1911 uh, has become a pioneer so far as uh, the understanding of and uh, understanding this uh, theory of political elitism is concerned in fact michels studied the german uh, social democratic party and tried to establish that a radical party a socialist german democratic party uh, it was functioning according to the principle of oligarchy uh, that is the iron law of oligarchy that is handful of people are important in the functioning of political party and since then this iron law of oligarchy of michel has become the important reference point for many scholars in comparative politics who want to study political party and uh, therefore uh, michel's become important but one thing is important to remember that michel's argument uh, is different from what pareto and mosca does uh mosca and pareto you know have argued and uh, reasons are very simple as i mentioned that pareto uh, you know emphasized only the psychological attributes mosca uh, took slightly more historical and sociological factors into consideration and michels when he goes to uh, make this analysis uh, in fact he takes into two consideration two different dimensions one is the organizational needs and another is the psychological needs and on basis of these organizational and psychological needs uh, michels lays the foundation for a very comprehensive analysis of political parties that is iron law of oligarchy that it is a kind of misconception that political parties there is a circulation of leaders uh, they are renewed through elections but fact of the matter is that only handful of people uh, ultimately decide the fate of the people and this is the circulation the same set of people are always in circulation so this is how uh, these three important pioneers of uh, you know the classical elitism had put forth uh, their argument now in the next lecture we will have more detailed discussion of michel's iron law of oligarchy and then also the modified elitist theory as i mentioned uh you know in case of uh you know uh, in case of uh, you know c right mills and others and then democratic elitism of sum peter that will take us to the discussion of political pluralism and marxist theory of ruling class thank you